Well, thank you for being here this afternoon for the fifth of our seven talks by Richard Norton Smith, who comes to us from George Mason University this week and has uh, entertained, regaled us with interesting anecdotes, stories, things that you've not heard. Uh, more is in store. I've gotten a little bit of a preview of some amazing things to come. It's vintage Richard Norton Smith. I have just a couple of announcements that I want to remind you of before I actually invite him onto the stage. First, um, I wanted to remind you that there is a venue change. Tomorrow morning, the 11 o'clock talk is going to be over at the Eberhard Center, the next building to the east. And the room number for that talk at 11 a.m. is 201-203. You just basically go up the stairs and it's the room right to the left in the Eberhard Center tomorrow. And for parking, you can go over to the Fulton Street lot underneath 131 and just go right across the street to the Eberhard Center, room 201-203. Second, um, there will be a book signing uh, after uh, today's talk, uh, just as there was at noon today. There will be another book signing at, at uh, 3 o'clock after today's uh, Calvin We Hardly Knew Ye talk. And um, unfortunately, I think there's only one copy of Patriarch Left, the biography of George Washington. So if you want to purchase a book of his to sign, it would be The Colonel, which is an outstanding uh, read, a great literary masterpiece, a book uh, that almost won the Pulitzer Prize, came very close to winning the Pulitzer Prize, and has been called uh, arguably the best single work on American journalism in our our history. So uh, a very uh, a good book and, indeed to read. And that wasn't said by me. <laughs> <laughs> it's spoken with true modesty here. Well, without further ado, I uh, welcome Richard Norton Smith to talk about Calvin Coolidge in our fifth talk of this seven series talk. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. On the politically explosive issue of taxes and the social safety net, the candidate drew a line in the sand. It may be that there would be votes for the Republican Party in the promise of low taxes and vanishing expenditures, he declared in the autumn of 1916. I am not one of those who believe votes are to be won by misrepresentations, skillful presentations of half-truths, and plausible deductions from false premises. Good government cannot be found on the bargain counter. We cannot curtail the usual appropriations or the care of mothers with dependent children or the support of the poor, the insane, and the infirm. Still more explicit was the Republican candidate for lieutenant governor of Massachusetts in contrasting his own position with the tax-cutting proposals put forth by his Democratic rival. As he said, our party will have no part in a scheme of economy which adds to the misery of the wards of the commonwealth, the sick, the insane, and the unfortunate, those who are too weak to protest. So vowed Calvin Coolidge, who in most history books lives on dimly as a prototype reactionary, the cheese-pairing tool of big business. If America has a civic faith, it is the near universal identification with personal freedom. But what exactly is freedom? Each generation, arguably each citizen, defines the term for himself. This helps to explain why leaders come in and out of fashion. It also gives rise to what I call the alternating currents of presidential leadership. In the aftermath of Franklin Roosevelt, that conservative radical, and Ronald Reagan, that radical conservative, we might segregate presidents into two admittedly oversimplified categories. Those who would free their countrymen through government, a la FDR, and those like Reagan who would free them from government. Clearly, Coolidge belongs to the second school. As such, it is hardly surprising that he should be held in low regard by New Deal historians. But time has a way of eroding orthodoxy, or at least of admitting doubt. More than 80 years have passed since a kerosene lit in a farmhouse in a remote Vermont hamlet witnessed the most dramatic of inaugurals for the most prosaic of presidents. To his acid-tongued contemporary H.L. Mencken, Coolidge was, quote, the greatest man ever to come out of Plymouth Notch, Vermont. <laughs> 
it would, in my opinion, be more accurate to say of Coolidge that he was preeminently a man of his time and place. Bred in the bone to accept what James McGregor Burns has called the 19th century's unquestioned dogma of the self-sufficient individual, autonomous, striving, competitive, and successful. In many ways, Coolidge is a throwback um, to those 19th century presidents uh, who had a view of the Constitution as a limiting rather than an enabling document. Uh, now, this viewpoint tends to disturb many a modern historian uh, for whom the great offense of 19th century presidents is their refusal to act like 20th century presidents. 19th century presidents were less colorful and more cautious than those swashbuckling egoists who stood at Armageddon, winning immortality through the words they spoke as much as the administrative or legislative actions they initiated. Who would you define the genius of American democracy as organization from the bottom up, not dictation or even inspiration from the top down? Not long before he left the White House, he declared, perhaps one of the most important accomplishments of my administration has been minding my own business. <laughs> Traditionally, so-called strong presidents have been lionized for their willingness to enlist the state in economic planning and the pursuit of long-delayed social justice, and understandably so. Coolidge, by contrast, has been seen as a mere caretaker, who if he didn't personally cause the Great Depression, stands accused of criminal negligence in not preventing it. And the 20s, well, the 20s are viewed not as a fertile period of economic creativity, a time when wages rose faster than in any other decade in the 20th century, when educational spending quadrupled and technology enhanced life in most American households. Rather, they're seen as a stifling chapter in dull complacency and Babylonian excess. At the center of it all stands this unlikeliest of popular heroes, who in his own lifetime became swathed in epigrammatic legend. Calvin, we hardly knew ye, in part because this dour, lonely, more than slightly mystical figure whose disdain for sham set him apart even in his own time and above all in his own profession, wished us to know only so much. When William Allen White, the great uh, Emporia, Kansas journalist, approached the president for an interview in 1925, Coolidge asked just exactly what White was seeking. White replied that he wanted a peek at the man behind the mask. I don't know if I can help you, mused Coolidge. Maybe there isn't any. Eighty years later, we are still peeking. For many years, Coolidge uh, and his family lived characteristically in a very small, very modest duplex house on Massasoit Street in Northampton, Massachusetts, uh, the monthly rent of which uh, did not exceed $28. Over the mantelpiece in the living room of the house was an embroidered quotation, which might very well have summed up Coolidge's public persona. A wise old owl sat on an oak. The more he saw, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard, why can't we be like that wise old bird? If Coolidge seemed enigmatic to his contemporaries, he appears prehistoric to those of us reared on today's political theater with its sound bites, focus groups, and cool blue backdrops. Only now are we rediscovering the progressive Massachusetts lawmaker and governor who favored votes for women, popular education of United States senators, and working man's compensation long before uh, they became popular. Governor Coolidge was especially outspoken in support of the teaching profession. While still a member of the legislature, he complained, quote, we compensate liberally the manufacturer and merchant, but we fail to appreciate those who guard the minds of our youth. As governor, Coolidge anticipated later rent control measures by enacting consumer safeguards and combating unscrupulous landlords. He championed public transportation and a reduction of working hours for women and children. We must humanize industry, he said, or the system will break down. <laughs> 